So Father, with grateful hearts, we continue to look up to you as we are gathered here for fellowship. And as we continue in fellowship, much more, Lord, as we listen to your word, we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to be upon each one of us. And the interpretation of your word to be upon each one of us as you speak to us differently, according to our desires, according to our needs. But much more than that, Lord, let your word be made alive in our lives. This we pray through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today is a special Sunday, a Sunday when we celebrate the Trinity, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And particularly now that we have experienced Pentecost and we are still experiencing Pentecost, here we are now that we are able to look back and look at the fulfillment of the scriptures when God promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and would be filled. And now that that prophecy has come to fulfillment, we gather together to celebrate God in his fullness. As we celebrate Trinity and of course Pentecost, and in line with our theme, reviving our call for divine humble service, we will look at the Trinity, of course, as we discuss it. But because we are coming from Pentecost, also Max will look at five marks of a spirit-filled life. Of course, we can add more in our personal Bible study or in our group Bible study. To begin with, God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, reveals himself in the Bible. And the Bible clearly tells each one of us that there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. At the same time, we encounter multiple passages in the Bible that show that God consists of more than one in persons. And some of the whether misunderstandings or disbeliefs around the Trinity, of course here we are an exception because we start our service literally confirming and affirming our belief in the Trinity. As Anglicans, we can go together in the name of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can have intercessions, the same one is done. It's a summary of the Trinity, of course, and yet, unfortunately, of course, there seems to, we seem to, or in our endeavor to understand and comprehend God in the Trinity, we, all of us, I think, have got a lot of questions around it. And that our questions around this is oftentimes answered by our own convictions and how we experience this God. At some point we have heard on how sometimes we look at, well, this is only the New Testament era, it's only the Holy Spirit era, sort of discarding the other side of God. And sometimes only limiting the Holy Spirit to only some works of the Spirit. And at some point, mainly the speaking in different languages or indeed only tongues. But it's not like that. We should not only look at God in only our human side or our human limitations or in our own logical contradictions, but that the complexity and the beauty of God being surpasses our understanding and that God is not man. When we take these passages that are talking about the reality of God together, we see there are actually three persons. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is what we call the Trinity. Of course, we will not find the term Trinity in the Bible as we scribble through our Bibles, but the concept is clear there that God is in three persons. In the Old Testament, there are various verses that distinguish God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One of the clear examples is Psalm 101 and verse 1, where David cries out, says, the Lord is my Lord, and makes that statement, the Lord is my Lord. Now, this is a king that is saying that. And now, since David is a king and does not have any other earthly lord, he must refer to a heavenly lord who is distinct from the Lord. Jesus confirms this when he claims this verse that he himself above and implies that he is the son of man. Even the gospel reading that we have read likens himself to the son of man. In other verses, a distinction is made between the Lord and the Spirit. For example, in Isaiah 48 and verse 16, and now the Lord God has sent me and his Spirit. It is obvious that someone cannot be thought of apart from his spirit, yet a distinction is made. Already in the Old Testament, we find verses that point us towards God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we struggle in trying to look at Jesus to say Jesus is only in the New Testament. And sometimes looking at the Old Testament to say that is for the Old Testament and now this is the New Testament, our focus being on Jesus and only the Holy Spirit. But yet we see God in his triune form even throughout the Bible from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. So God the Son did not come into existence with the birth of Jesus Christ. He is eternal just like the Father and the Spirit, but Jesus, he became flesh. The New Testament makes this so much clear. Many verses teach about the divinity of God and the Father. For example, in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6, for, those, for there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom all things, and many, verses teach us about the divinity of God and the Son. And we see this also in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Many verses teach us about the divinity of the Holy Spirit and of course even in the second reading we read today, and Paul continues to remind us that we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In several places in the New Testament, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are mentioned next to each other. In a way, leaves no doubt that there is equal and equally God in all these things. Reminds me of our discussion yesterday with our confirmation class. It happens to be the topic we are looking at. And so is the issue of Hira came about and how we look at God the Father, God the Son in the context of Hira. Is it a horizontal Hira or a vertical Hira? Is God the Father above the Son? And all the questions that may come around it. And that really God in his triune form is not an issue of hierarchy, but it is himself manifesting himself in all three forms. Church, as God reveals himself in the Bible through the Father, through the Son, and through the Holy Spirit, we need them all. God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Savior, and God the Holy Spirit, 
who sanctifies us. We cannot completely wrap our heads around the concept of God as a God who is three in one, but yet he allows us that we experience him in all forms. And getting back to how God the Holy Spirit sanctifies and how God and what God desires from us is I will share three things therefore that a person who has encountered this God in his triune form and much more having filled with this Holy Spirit. First mark is the restoration of relationship. A spirit-filled life can only happen when our relationship with God has happened. Pentecost, which was last week, having received the Holy Spirit and of course learning about the Holy Spirit, is that Pentecost is not a day we celebrate. It is a life we ought to live. The Spirit of God in us enables us to relate with God himself. When we read through the scriptures, one of the things that we see is a relationship that is quite deep between God and us. Such a deep relationship can only be lived by a spirit-filled life. I'm reminded of the relationship oftentimes that is shared between especially babies, toddlers to be specific, and the dear mothers. The connection that is there between the mother and the child and the consents before they get into adolescence. Huh? But that connection that is there between the two, that a mother feels the child is still a part of me and they are not far off. And the child as well knows who the mother is. Even if auntie, uncle or big sister comes around, they know when mom is around. Now that connection so intimate is because of the relationship that is being shared at that time. And now if the Holy Spirit is God himself and having filled us, so he has therefore that connection with us through himself. That when he looks at us, he's not looking at me as Geoffrey, but he's looking at me in the eyes of himself because having been in me. And so he, God is trying to restore this relationship that I want to be with you. I want you to relate with me. And so in the psalm that we have actually chanted this morning, the Bible says, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you are mindful of him? Well, man, you may not be mindful of him, but because I have poured myself in him, therefore I'm mindful of him because I'm mindful of myself. When God says that his word will not return to him void, it's because when he speaks his word unto us, it's beyond us. If the word of God has come to us through a prophecy, through the word of God, is that God is not just speaking a word unto somebody or something, but God is speaking his word to himself. He looks in us himself. And so restoring the relationship between him and us is that we, as he mirrors himself, as he should be able to see himself, but we should also be able to see God in our lives. And so that's why he calls out unto us to say, be holy for I'm holy. And that's why he says, okay, fine, you are humans. Yes, you may fail. Yes, you may have all the justifying reasons to that. But he says, even a righteous man will fall seven times and rise again. Not one who has already fallen. Why does he say a righteous one will rise again? He's on to restoring the relationship that he has with himself in us. Church, let us therefore be bold that we are just not mere humans. In us, we carry God himself. Secondly, as we continue to thank God for his manifestation unto us in his triune form, 
We also thank God for his power and authority. A spirit-filled life is a life that has the power and authority. It says then when you receive the Holy Spirit and then power. And we know that anything associated with the Holy Spirit is power associated. And this power associated is not meant to only be read and known about. The power and authority of God is meant to be experienced. The power and authority of God is meant to be experienced. As we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are meant that others will see that power and will experience that power. And so as the disciples of Jesus Christ are walking in the streets and having been Holy Ghost filled, they find a man at the door of the day. <coughs> and there they are, they are begging. And say, it's not silver and gold we do not have. But what we have, we shall give to you. What is it that they had? Something more than silver or gold, which was power that comes from above. Rise up and walk. And immediately he rose up and began to walk. And this power is, is so evident, you can see, you cannot question that power of God when it's upon you and as you experience it and deliver it to others. It's a power that and authority that you cannot question. Because we know that if someone hasn't been walking, they need to go through some walking, some lessons on how to walk. And even if it's in an adult, we need to get to our health outreach. Do you have a fees on your health outreach? Can we have someone begin to teach this person how to walk and all that? Where are they? Tente, tente, and all that. But yet with this one, it was as immediate. The power and authority was so evident. And that is the power and authority that is now given unto us. That we shall lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. That we shall speak and it shall become. That we shall wake and operate in a different grace. And that's why Paul says, you, know, you may not be able to, by your human, you will not understand. But all we need to do is believe this God. Experience his power and authority and demonstrate it much more. All of us as believers are meant not only to live in this power, but also to demonstrate this power. Laying hands on the sick is not only for the clergy. No. Laying hands on the sick is for every born again believer that is a child of God and is spirit filled. Speaking unto situations is not only for a certain people, it's for every child of God that is spirit filled that we shall speak and it shall become. We shall speak and it shall become. The Spirit of God is not only now. The Bible tells us in Genesis that the earth was without void. And the Spirit of God was hovering around. The Spirit has always been present. And God says, let there be and it was. And therefore, if we carry that authority. You know, even if we were to receive here a son or daughter of a king, the accorded respect actually will be given. They will be given. So it is as us who are children of God, we also carry the power and authority from this God that we serve. This God that is our Father. This God that through Jesus Christ died for our sins. Thirdly, the evidence of a spirit-fueled life is a life of revival. Now, obviously, by revival, we are looking at either something that is not there or something that used to be there and has to come back in one way or another, either in the same way or in a different form, but much more more than that. And this year as a parish, and that is our focus, that our lives will be revived. It doesn't matter how many times we have fallen or how we fell, but right now, all that matters 
is like the blind man, but may as one said, I was blind, now I see. There should be no doubt. It doesn't matter how our falling was, but I am revived. I should be revived. Our ministries need to be revived. Our cell groups need to be revived. Our parish needs to be revived. But our ministries, our cell groups, our parishes will not see revival if the people, the individuals, haven't yet encountered revival. We can only give what we have. We cannot give what we do not have. If revival hasn't come in our personal lives, our families won't see it. Our ministries won't see it. Our cell groups won't experience it. Neither our parish will it experience it. And so as individuals, we must endeavor, having been filled with this power of God, having been filled with this Holy Spirit, endeavor to experience, encounter, and live this revived life. The Holy, he poured out the spirit of all flesh that they might be revival. May we not disappoint our God by getting the power of revival and sitting on it. And remember when God gives us anything and we do not use it, what does he do? He, he gets it back. He gets it back. God mustn't get back that power of revival. It is our prayer that this year we will experience, encounter, and live that revival. That we shall testify. It, once not a people, now a people. We are revived. This humble service will not just end on posters and car stickers, will not just end on the bulletin and reading it and sometimes sharing it and it ends there. No. It must be lived. It's meant to be a lifestyle. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. This God is our advocate. This triune God, this Trinity reminds us that God is our advocate. And as I, on this point, I was almost being tempted to call out one of the lawyers to talk about being a lawyer. Because, you know, oftentimes, the different sides to it is that you still need a lawyer, whether you've got an issue or not. You need a lawyer. The three people you need, whether with issues or not, a doctor, a lawyer, and a priest. You can say amen, especially on the priest. Amen. And so, whether we have issues or not, we need counsel with this lawyer, etc. And especially when you have issues, you hear English come out of their mouth. I can't say anything until I speak to my lawyer. And you also realize that actually when you get yourself a lawyer and you're in court, Sit there and he will do the rest of the work for you. And the different dynamics about it, which at least I have heard and watched because I'm not one, <laughs> is that you also see as well and witness how they protect the client, how they guide the client. In the closet, you'll be told, tell me everything. Don't leave out everything, anything. And how you need to be open to them. And how no matter what you did, but yet when you get into that courtroom, how you are being saved, and how someone is talking and defending you, and all that. Church, imagine God saying, I'm your advocate. I'm standing in for you. I'm speaking for you. What is it that you're going through? I'll speak for you. When God tells us in his, script, in his word that even before we pray, he knows what we are asking for. 
because himself in us is already knowing what we need. And even when the scriptures again remind us that he teaches us equally how to pray and Jesus says, oh, sit here, let me teach you how to pray. You shall say, our Father who art in, in heaven. Again, reminding us all this of how much an advocate he is to us. God is our advocate. What are we going through? He's there to speak for us. He's there to fight for us. And he's there, of course, like the Bible reminds us that if you human beings and if you earthly fathers know how to, good, to give good gifts to your children, how much more? If a lawyer here will look for the best for me as a client, how much more, my Father in heaven, will he look forward to my best? God is looking after us. God is there to fight for us. In those moments when we ask questions, where is my God? And we feel alone, let us be reminded that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I don't know if you are going to find any lawyer you have built a relationship with and is a good one and they will run when you are in a typical mess. I don't think so. But they will ensure that somehow, somewhere, they help you and you get the best of everything or anything. This God is our advocate. As I conclude, as God, as we celebrate the Trinity, and as we celebrate God in his manifestations, especially post-Pentecost, having released this power, is that this power is not only for us, it's not only to be demonstrated in what we may only incline to being powerful. This power is not only to cast out demons. This, on, this power is not only to enable us to speak in tongues. This power is not only to enable us to seem to be the anointed ones. This power is meant to give us power to evangelize. Power for missions. It's power to evangelize as well. When you have received the Holy Spirit and this power, you, he says he's sending us out to preach the word of God. In all the ends, and to preach this word through the word itself, like we are doing here, or I'm doing here, but also through our life and through our actions. We are to preach the word of God. He says, when I was hungry, you, you did not clothe, when I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I didn't have clothes, you didn't clothe me. When were you in prison? When were you hungry? When did I close? And says, when you did it for others, you did it for me. And this has been said time and again even about the parish in terms of how much we need to reach out. That in whatever God has blessed us with, we are also to bless others. That we are not blessed for nothing or blessed to just get blessed, but we are blessed to be a blessing. That what we have, others are not privileged actually to have. Like one of the testimonies that we will hear about our book drive, uh, which we were singing about and the parish did support our teens through. There's one, when the vote of thanks was being given, and you know, oftentimes when we give the last sentence, receive our small gift, usually to, whether it's genuinely small or is to seem humble is another thing, but receive this small gift. And the head teacher of the school in uh, Chinunyo where we went says, it's not a small gift actually because more than 600 children were given books, pens, rubbers, pens, and pencils. So is this rubber that you have given to each child in a class 
of 38, only two children have got rubbers. And these are 15 way rubbers. So for them, it's not as small as we are looking at it or relating with it. But we don't have a struggle. And they said, these books you brought last week, the, week, the time we went, they were saying last week we had the end of term exams. And we had to give children pieces of paper to write on their exams because they didn't have books. The impact of what us as a parish did is much more than we can ever imagine. The Holy Spirit, and how did people just come up, sit down, let's do a book drive, let's go and donate books, start talking about books, have different people here, have our young people here asking for books. How did it come? How was that school thought about? I think this is all the power of God. And God sending us on a mission and God equipping us on that mission and God literally saying, you know, I want you not only to preach this word every Sunday, but I want you to live by it. Go forth and evangelize. Go forth and do missions. Church, we are called to do missions. Just remind your neighbor, do missions. I remind them like you believe the word of God. And this year, if you have never evangelized, this year, outside there, will be greeting each other. How are you evangelists? How are you evangelists? Because all of us are going out to preach this word in one way or another. That will be a blessing to someone. That when we are around, surely people will be blessed. Our presence will be a blessing unto others. That whatever means God has given you, you will use those means to be a blessing to others. Sometimes it's the divine wisdom that God has given you. It's meant to bless others. You are meant to preach the way to evangelize through that wisdom that you have. Through those gifts that God has given you, you are meant to preach the word of God. May we not sit on our gifts. May we not sit on our calling. But the power of God, the power of Trinity is that experience God in his fullness. You have life and have it in fullness. And so we shall preach the word of God in its fullness. We shall be a blessing to someone. We shall endeavor to be a blessing to someone. You shall check up on somebody. There are people we haven't seen in church for a long time. And it just ends at Mary thinking about them. We haven't seen, yes, I haven't seen, even me, I haven't seen, even you. Ah, may God deliver us. But what have we done about it? What have we done about it? Ah, this, so and so hasn't been active. Yes, I've seen so in, the, in our cell group, WhatsApp group, we are quite numerous. When we meet for Bible study, ah, lo and behold, what are the people, what are we all doing about it? It's a collective ministry. It's a shared ministry. What are we doing about it? Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Let's be practical. In our ways of evangelizing our ways of mission. And it's not in how small it may seem to be, but it's in the impact it makes in other people's life. It may just be a text message to someone. You never know what that message might be doing. You're just greeting them and praying for them, that's it. You never know what you're doing. Sometimes they are literally just there sitting and wondering and asking God, where are you, Lord? And you are just that person who's reminding them of the presence of God. There are moments when our relatives who haven't yet gotten in church in a long time, we're just there. I think after this, it's a time to send all those messages. Let us deplete those soche paxi, those 1,000 messages we have. Let us call somebody. Let us reach out to somebody. 
Let's invite someone to church. Let's invite someone for fellowship. Let us identify someone's gift and calling and say, come on, uh, maybe you can do this. Let us identify those with the wonderful voice. Let us identify them. I'm sure you can come and join us in the worship ministry and you'll be able to chant better than Father Geoffrey actually. Come on and be and come for rehearsal. We can. You can look at somebody and be able to identify them. Oh, this person can reach out. Well, come forth. Let, let us equip each other and let us send each other out for missions. Let us join ministries. Some of us are here and I tell you, when we greet you and you give us those smiles, we see that God is with me. Join the ushering ministry and just, just say morning to us there. And I tell you, before even Father comes to preach here, someone is already ministered to. They feel the welcome. We are graced and blessed differently. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless us.